Advanced polls are now open in Ontario for the provincial election. And with less than two weeks to go in the campaign, two leaders have been diagnosed with COVID and are isolating. Andrea Horvath and Mike Schreiner are off the trail for precautions. Which way will Ontario go on June 2nd? Hello and welcome to Unpublished Cafe. I'm Ed Hand. The final debate was Monday, the last chance for leaders to make an impression and perhaps a knockout punch. And I'll be honest, for all the hype, it was pretty dull in terms of debate and discussion. And I think that sums up this campaign. Not a lot of thought on policy, definitely not much in terms of comparing the parties on platform. Our unpublished I vote question asks you, what do you think will be the outcome of the Ontario election? A PC majority, a liberal majority, a PC minority, a liberal minority, or an NDP minority? You can log on and vote right now at unpublished.vote and have your voice heard. This campaign appeared to be a referendum on Doug Ford's handling of the pandemic, but the skyrocketing cost of living has surfed to the top of the list of concerns for Ontarians. That distracts from the last two years in the province. Coming up on the Unpublished Cafe, we'll chat with Andrew Enns, Vice President at Leger 360, about how Ontario views the candidates as well. Jean Viev Tellier of the University of Ottawa will join us. But first, I'm pleased to be joined by Mark Winfield, Professor of Political Science at York University. And Mark, you find this PC government is more reactionary than proactive. That doesn't seem to fit the PC ideology. How did it get to this point? Well, it's an interesting question, but I think part of it comes back to that the government was elected in 2018 with a very without a very clear notion of what it is the province should do. I mean, the platform was very much cut taxes, cut red tape, cut hydro rates. And things have got more complicated since then, principally because of COVID. Um, but the government, I think, is, has struggled a great deal with this, that, that what you've seen is a pattern of, of really only acting when things have reached the point of being an acute crisis. And in some cases with COVID, that was clearly too late and then sort of forced fairly aggressive interventions. But I think this is more deeply part of, of the Ford government's governing style, is it, it's not one that has a particular vision for what the province should be doing, and so tends not to act until problems are really obvious in its face. And, and unfortunately, that usually is, is too late. You know, when we talk about the, the way they make their decisions uh, more reacting than anything else, how's that sitting with the traditional PC voters? Well, this is an interesting question about who who the voters are for Mr. Ford and how much there are what you might consider traditional PC voters who might have been sort of associated with someone like Bill Davis, um, who I think are less and less uh, comfortable with with Mr. Ford as go, as, has gone. I mean, he's really broken a lot from the norms of that period in Ontario politics. Which some people would argue ran up through Mr. McGinty and maybe even Kathleen Wynne of sort of moderation, fiscal prudence, but also proactive governance. Um, but in exchange, the, the sort of base of the progressive conservative party now has shifted. There's a combination of the old rural central Ontario base, which was always there. But then on top of that, there is the so-called Ford Nation, uh, which is in the outer suburbs of Toronto and then the 905 region around Toronto as well. So the base has shifted, and with that, maybe shifts in, in the norms that kind of define the old PC Ontario party. You know, when, you look, when we look at the platform, the, the centerpiece mm-hmm. appears to be the $10 billion 413 project in the heart of the 905. Is that to kind of reason, you know, that's what's needed to win the election? Is that the reason the, the, the 413 is such a big focus? Well, that seems to be, I mean, that seems to have been the rationale there, that this is something that would play well with voters in the 905. Now, in practice, it's starting to look like this is turning into a bit more complicated uh, than Mr. Ford had anticipated, that the 413 would run right through the Greater Toronto Area Greenbelt, which has sort of acquired a kind of iconic status even among 905 voters. And so that landscape is, is getting more complicated. Uh, the government has also made some very aggressive moves on land use planning and development in the 905, particularly in Markham, Richmond Hill. Hamilton's being threatened a bit as well with a fairly heavy handed uh, intervention by the province. Um, and I get the impression that's not playing that well as well, that the, that the government, one of the political risks for the government at this stage is it's sort of overplaying this get it done theme in sort of plowing through 
any kind of opposition. And in some cases, these may not be projects that are really playing that well in some of these regions. You know, you, you, you talk about uh, the municipalities and uh, more authority, exercising more authority over municipalities, but they are creatures of the province. I can, I can understand, but PCs are usually, you know, less government, not more overreach. Well, this again seems to be a bit of a break that that yeah. from the sort of traditional small government conservatism, um, limited government. Instead, what we've seen is is a well uh, assertive, bordering on authoritarian kind of approach from the provincial government, especially in dealing with local governments. Um, we saw that very early on with the decision to cut the city of Toronto council in half in the middle of the election campaign, and indeed to threaten to invoke. Uh, Section 33 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which has never been done in Ontario before, uh, to do it. And then we've seen it on these more specific planning issues in Toronto, and as I say now in the 905, of reaching in very, very directly at levels of fairly specific local plans and simply saying what the municipality had decided to do is out the window and that we're going to dictate what happens. And in practice, that has tended to align very, very closely with what the development industry wanted to see. In, in terms of uh, the upcoming election, the, the, the PCs cruising it uh, well towards majority territory right now, what do you see as a possible uh, road bump for the PCs in the next two weeks? Well, there, there are a couple. Uh, I mean, the environment generally, I think, is a little bit of a sleeper in this campaign. We did see it come up. It surprised me how much it came up during the debate, even when it wasn't supposed to be the topic of discussion. These questions kept rising to the surface, particularly the 413 Bradford Bypass, for example, but other things as well. Um, so I think there's 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 a question, is, is there issues there? Is there a vulnerability, especially in the 905 region around this potential overreach on the part of the province. We, we were seeing pushback around some of the development stuff and around the 413 and Greenbelt issues that could translate into trouble in, in the 905. The other possibility though, it, it hasn't happened yet. I mean, you know, that, that, that one of the opposition parties sort of starts to emerge as, as a potential leader, but you know, this is a big underlying question at the moment is, is how much, of, of the apparent success the PCs is really that what they're doing and what they're proposing to do is really resonating versus the weakness of the alternatives. And, and so does this really represent a shift in Ontario politics or is this more of a fluke in terms of, of relatively weak and unattractive alternatives, which are then very helpful to Mr. Ford in terms of regaining his majority? Mark, I want to thank you for joining us. Great. Thank you very much. Mark Winfield's a professor of political science at York University. It's been a roller coaster ride for the PCs the last two years in Ontario. While coming to Queen's Park with a majority, the COVID pandemic initially blew a hole in the party's support. Jean Viet Delier is professor at the Faculty of Social Sciences and Political Studies at the University of Ottawa, and she joins us now. And Jean Viet, you find all the parties were missing something in their platform, something to address the number one concern affordability. Is that a lack of preparation by the parties or is that just reality just imposing itself? I would say both. Um, yes, it's a lack of preparation because that's a new topic in the electoral uh, campaign. Uh, we used to talk about the economy going that very well, uh, the issue of jobs, and so each party wants to create more jobs. And so it's funny because this time we still see that in the platform of uh, about uh, about all parties that they want to create new jobs. But the fact is that the employment is going very well and the issue has shifted. And now it's not the job creation that is a problem, it's uh, inflation. And so there we're not very prepared to address that issue. And on top of that, it is a global uh, problem. So if we're talking about lack of preparation, uh, not entirely, because uh, I don't think that one province in Canada can, can solve that major uh, economic aspect. And so uh, Ontarians are going to have to wait and see what's going on on the world, uh, in the planet, on the planet uh, about that, that specific uh, issue.
You know, a lot of pundits expected this election would be one on the PC's handling of the pandemic. But even going by the debate on, on Monday night, you can see that wasn't the case. When did that change? I think it changed uh, very early into the, the, the pandemic. For me, it was clear at the from the beginning that voters do not reward past achievements. They are forward-looking, and so they want to see which party, which premier would best do the job in the eventuality that maybe a new crisis arrive, arrives. So I think that Doug Ford has established that he is able to manage a, a major crisis. Uh, that certainly changed the perception of many voters during the pandemic. But I don't think that voters were, in fact, concerned about how to get out of the pandemic now that we are out of it. And so there are other more pressing issues that are on the voters' mind, and they are looking for other things. So. Uh, as a, to, to summarize, the pandemic does have a certain impact, but maybe not the impact that most uh, thought it would have. It, so it's not a referendum on the past performance, but it's more about assessing who's best to manage maybe the next uh, crisis, whatever it's a pandemic or something else. So you don't expect over the next two weeks leading up to the election, we'll hear too much chatter from the opposition about uh, the handling of the pandemic. No, I don't. And if you recall the debate of uh, this week, uh, the the moment where Doug Ford performed per, per, performed the best uh, was at his best was when he was challenged with his uh, management of the pandemic. And so you th- you saw again the Doug Ford that we saw every day, uh, talking to Ontarian and taking that topic at heart and saying, yeah, yes, it's it's an issue. I'm struggling. I'm trying to find new uh, uh, a way to get out of it. And so we ha- we saw the combative dog for it. And that was a, a good a good show for him during the, the debate. So I would guess that all of the party, all opposition party would now be shy of stepping into that again. And so they will want to focus the conversation on other aspect than the management of the pandemic, where dog for it in a sense kind of reveal himself for many Ontarians. You know, more than there's more than half a million francophones in this province and none of the leaders speak the language, at least fluently. Is that going, going to have an impact on this or at least on the francophone voter? It's interesting. There was a survey published this morning by uh, Radio Canada, and in this survey, a uh, majority of Ontarians, French speaking, it was only French speaking uh, Ontarians that were uh, polled. And so um, the result of that was that uh, Francophones don't know who is Stephen Del Duca. And so the fact that he doesn't speak French probably is a major issue because traditionally the Liberal Party has been seen favorably by Francophones because of all the initiatives that was that were adopted, especially by the Win uh, government. So yes, the fact that leaders don't speak French is an issue. They have tried because there was a French debate and uh, at the beginning there were, there were clips from each leader and each one tried to say a few words in French. Uh, but yes, uh, that that is a problem, especially for the Liberal Party, as I said, because uh, in the past, uh, Dalton McGuinty and Kathleen Wynne were able to speak French. And so that kind of make a difference, made a difference. This is a different looking PC party than what took over in 2018. They've kicked out some some MPPs for, for their far right perspectives. You know, I think Randy Hillier. Uh, there's a few others. And they've also lost one of the liberals over uh, their scrapping of the French language commissioner. What, what's the image of the party now? For the francophone? For, for all. Ontario. For all. Yeah. Um, yes, the conservative has changed. Uh, and I, I would say that it's part the, the big, uh, mostly because of Doug Ford. Um, Doug Ford came in into provincial politics without knowing much of provincial politics. And so it was somebody from Toronto speaking to Torontarians. Um, now with, and I think because of the pandemic, uh, Doug Ford has established himself as being a leader for the province, as being the premier of the province and speaking to everybody in the province. And so uh, he was able also to shape the party, uh, which is less polarized, I would say, than in 2018. Uh, you recall how fierce he was attacking uh, Kathleen Wynne at that time. And so we saw the tone that changed. And um, th- his attitude, Doug Ford's attitude, has changed a lot. So uh, is that change towards the federal government, for instance, um, and also towards all uh, regions of the province. And he, as I said, he's more uh, a premier of everybody in Ontario than he used to be. And so uh, I would say because of that, 
droite, the Conservative, Conservative Party, has become a bit more mainstream conservative, not entirely, but uh, much less to the right than probably we would have thought in 2018. You know, it, when I look at uh, the campaign or, or let's say even the last few few months for the Ontario PCs, it's, you know, rolling out the uh, the spending along with, uh, you know, getting rid of your license sticker fees, that kind of a thing. Um, it, it seems the, the, the Ford uh, conservatives are, are shifting a little bit to the left a, a bit, much like, you know, Jean Chrétien back in the early 90s when they went to the right. Uh, do you see it that way or no? I would say it's too soon for me because mm -hmm. um, conservative party always have a, a paradox, a problem, the <laughs> year of an election. And so, of course, they, they won't be able to cut spending. It wouldn't be wise to do so. Um, I think that, yes, Doug Ford wanted to balance the book in 2022. We know why it didn't happen. And so I will wait until after the election, and I suppose Doug Ford will be re-elected, and, uh, and see if, in fact, uh, his narrative or his views on the budget have changed. I'm not certain 100%. I think that some cut uh, will occur. Uh, if you look at the last budget, uh, yes, more spending on health education, but we haven't talked much about the other, depart uh, about the other uh, um, area, the other departments, and it wouldn't be impossible. It would be possible, I think, that some cut could occur. And the fact is that we haven't questioned that much Doug for during the election campaign about that. So we don't really know what are the plans of the Conservative after uh, the election. And I may add, we still don't have a cost platform from the Conservative. We have mm -hmm. a budget, but that budget is about new initiative announced this year. I would expect that the next Conservative government, if that's the case, would have new proposition next year, in two years, in three years. And we don't know anything about that. So uh, that's why I have some inter interrogation marks about that. Well, and, and I'll bring this up too. Like, you know, when you talk about you haven't been able to question Ford, well, he is, hasn't exactly been the most uh, open person or a lot of the, the conservative uh, candidates with the media. Which is kind of something we expected. Uh, his relationship with the media has improved because of the pandemic. Recall four years ago, he was really running to avoid being uh, asked questions by the media. But you're right. This is quite surprising. I think in the last, uh, the last week, he was uh, out of sight for three days, which is something we never see during an election campaign. Now, uh, we are saying that this election is for Ford to lose. So uh, the less... Uh, things he says, the less controversy he creates, uh, the better it is for the Conservatives. So I think that uh, his um, team is trying to avoid any uh, potential controversy that could arise. And that's why we don't see him that much. jean Viev, I want to thank you for joining us. So it was my pleasure. jean Viev Tellier is a professor in the Faculty of Social Sciences and Political Studies at the University of Ottawa. If the political waters in Ontario remain fairly calm, it appears the PCs are looking at another majority, according to Leger 360, Andrew Anz is executive vice president, and he joins us now. And Andrew, right now, the PCs around 37% support and flirting with a majority. Now, looking back uh, to 2018 to now, there's been little change in support over that four years, 41 to 37% and a little bit of bumps in between. Is that the way you've seen it? Yeah, you know, for sure, Ed. I'd say that, uh, you know, some of those bumps were during the pandemic and they, they hit a couple of, uh, you know, rough patches there. But but even those rough patches, their support, uh, you know, dipped into the, you know, lower mid 30s um, and they quickly rebounded. I think the, uh, you know, the party has hung into that band of, of, uh, of that 37 to 39 percent, which you point out it's not the it's not the forty one percent that got them their their strong majority in in twenty eighteen, but I dare say the the splits between the two the two parties as they stand now, the Liberals and the NDP, uh, I think that 30, uh, 37, 38 percent will actually still produce uh, a, a pretty solid result for the for the PCs. So I think at this stage they're feeling uh, okay with how things have uh, played out in the campaign. In, in terms of Ontarians, what what are the issues that are they that they're following the most? What are the most closest to their heart? 
Well, in, in our polling, we're certainly picking up the, you know, the, the, the cost of living, uh, you know, pressures, the rising cost of, uh, of groceries, gasoline prices uh, have caught their attention. Uh, you know, we were in field a couple of weeks ago and picked up on some of those, uh, some of those issues. Housing obviously is another one that is a, is a, is a big topic. And, um, you know, it's, it's, a uh, you know, it's a topic that's really spread out to a much broader cross section from, from our data, a much broader cross section of the, uh, you know, of the public in terms of, uh, and not just the, you know, a lot of it focuses on, on the, on the, on those who are buying a house or looking to buy a house, but it's also hitting the renters, uh, like that rental market has been, has been, uh, and so we're, we're seeing that kind of, uh, you know, uh, creep in and, and it, um, you know, so so that's a big issue, and uh, and then there's also you know the um, the talk around sort of pandemic recovery, and and those are the topics around healthcare, you know, the wait lists, the 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 staff, uh, the HR situation, and some of the seniors care. I'd say those are a second tier kind of issue, but still ones that um, that all parties are speaking to, and 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 voters are listening for. Are are Ontario's engage Ontarians engaged in this election? You know, I'd say they're. I'd say they're engaged on on kind of that that average typical election. I don't think this is a um, uh, like more. There, there's more energy and, and engagement with this election than anything you know uh, that we've seen before. Like I look back to say the 2015 federal election when Stephen Harper and Justin Trudeau squared off. That was a high engagement election. Uh, it brought in a lot of those young voters. Uh, you know, you recall uh, Justin Trudeau had his marijuana, marijuana promise. So there was a, I would say that was a bit of a amped up. And plus it was a change election. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I like to sort of look at those where there was a real attitude in, in the country for change. This one doesn't have that same level of intensity. Um, you know, our, our, our numbers are showing about 60% of Ontarians are, are sort of following it on a few times a week. And and that, to me, uh, you know, when I've looked back at some other elections, is kind of where I, you know, that's the average. And if that's the case, which party benefits from, I guess, a less engaged Ontario? I think probably the government will, will mm -hmm. probably benefit from that. I mean, I think they've, uh, you know, look, the government's got more incumbents. The incumbents tend to have a better, uh, uh, you know, uh, connection and, and uh, um, you know, with, with some of the voters in those ridings. I think that they, uh, they benefit from not having any sort of, you know, big one issues that pop up and can sort of, uh, uh, you know, destabilize the government. So I, I suspect the, the PCs are comfortable with sort of a moderately engaged electorate. You know, the opposition can't seem to get much in the way of traction. Is that a reflection on them or is that a reflection on the strength of the PCs? Well, I'd say it's probably a combination, uh, you know, Ed, I think the, uh, you know, Doug Ford, say what you will, uh, you know, and he had his he had his ups and downs during the pandemic. But, you know, when we were polling government satisfaction and management of the pandemic throughout the entire two years of that, you know, at the end of the day, the, the Ontario government did reasonably well when I look at, at, at how other governments fared in, in the country. Um, you know, they, they stayed above that 50 percent status, you know, overall satisfied level. Um, so I think that's given. The, the government a little bit of, of the ability to, to, to deflect some of that pandemic criticism that the opposition parties are really pushing hard at, at various stages. So I think that, so the government has a bit of, uh, you know, Teflon on, on that, I would say. And I think the opposition parties, um, you know, in part, the, the pandemic was hard on opposition because it really robbed a bit of that spotlight uh, you know, from them to some degree. I mean, there was a period of time they had to be sort of all hands on deck and, 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 uh, you know, we're all in this together sort of thing. And then, um, and then it made them, you know, at times sounding a bit, a bit trill and a little bit sort of over the top in some of their, uh, some of their concerns. And I think that's hard for the electric sort of square now in, in a campaign in terms of, you know, is this rhetoric or is this, you know, what are you going to do for me here? Right. Yeah. You know, the, con the conservatives seem to be avoiding debates at all costs. A lot of candidates, conservative candidates, uh, avoiding those debates. And, and Ford is not doing interviews. Does the public care about access to the politicians? You know, I'd, I'd say, I'd say again, go back to my uh, comment that, I, like, in our numbers, this doesn't really, you know, have that sense of a change election. 
So I don't know if the if the if the public is really clamoring for that uh, that access and that pound, you know, in some respects, that pound of flesh that they want out of the government. And so, in this sense, you know, maybe keeping a lower profile and and uh, you know and and uh, Premier Ford keeping sort of a you know measured uh, you know media availability might not be a bad strategy. You know, avoid the uh, you know avoid any sort of opportunities to create an issue, which uh, you know that that for them is probably a paramount uh, goal going into the last ten days. Well, we're, uh, yeah, obviously say less than uh, two weeks to go. What, what can change the trajectory right now? Well, obviously, you know, you, you look for sort of any kind of uh, potential gaff or, or something like that, like that would be, uh, you know, something the conservatives will want to be, uh, be very careful of. I think that the opposition parties will certainly be looking to ramp up some of those, uh, you know, some of those attacks on, on the government to see what they can do. Um, I think from from the government's perspective, they'll want to keep this on their back to their message of the economy, recovery, stability. Um, you know, as best they can. I, I think it, it's it's hard to predict if there's really something out there that uh, you know that can really um, you know shake things up. I mean, the, there's been some really large promises, some, some fairly I'd say out there promises. You know, of one dollar transit fares for the next couple of years hasn't really grabbed the voter in, in my perspective anyways when I look at the, the coverage in the media hasn't really grabbed the voter's imagination as a as something that's that's uh, you know kind of galvanizing support you know so uh, it, it's going to be challenging Andrew I want to thank you for joining us All right, I appreciate the opportunity and uh, you know good luck with uh, with more of your prod podcasts and let's see what happens on June 2nd Andrew Enns is Executive Vice President of Leger 360. Our unpublished.vo question asks you, what do you think will be the outcome of the Ontario election? A PC majority, a Liberal majority, a PC minority, a Liberal minority, or an NDP minority? You can log on and vote right now at unpublished.vote. I want to thank our guests today, Mark Winfield at York University, jean viev Tellier at the University of Ottawa, and Andrew Enns of Leger 360. And I want to thank you for watching the Unpublished Cafe. Stay safe. I'm Ed Hand.